Welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast, where mental health professionals share information and perspectives that illuminate, educate, and is worthy of a mental note. And now your host, Chris Quarto. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm your host, Chris Quarto. Well, as I told you before, this podcast series is coming to an end and will be replaced with a new one called Private Practice Journeys. So if you're interested in starting or expanding a private practice, then you'll want to check it out. Now, I'll say more about that at the end of today's podcast episode, which is with Aaron Patel from the Veterans Administration Hospital in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, who talks about counseling older veterans. So here's Aaron. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Quarto, and welcome again to the final episode of the Make a Mental Note podcast series. And today I am joined by Aaron Patel, who is a licensed psychologist and assistant chief and director of training uh, for psychology at the Veterans Administration Tennessee Valley Healthcare System. Did I get that right, Aaron? You did, Chris. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. Well, if you wouldn't mind, uh, tell the mental note-taking audience a little bit about uh, what you do at the VA specifically. Mm-hmm. So right now I'm primarily in administration, um, hence my titles of assistant chief and director of training. Right. Um, we have a large training program, internship, and postdoc. Um, and then clinically, I am a board-certified geropsychologist, and so I see um, – older veterans for therapy and also for some assessment services in an interprofessional clinic setting. Fantastic. And that's what I wanted you to uh, talk about today was more of the geropsychology uh, work that that you've done and you've been trained in and all that kind of stuff. I I don't think we've had anybody yet on the podcast series who's really talked about um, the issues of the of more of an elderly uh, population. So I'll be interested in hearing more about that. But uh, let's just start off, Aaron, um, talking about why you got involved in the in the helping profession. Maybe you could share with the mental note takers what motivated you to go in that direction. What's your story? Mm-hmm. So um, when I was a child, I was very close with my um, grandparents, and I look at them now and see that they were really old for their age. Uh Um, I hope the viewers understand what that (laughs) means. Um, And they had a lot of health complications and problems. And I just remember providing care for them really as a young child. Uh Um, My grandfather had emphysema and I would take his temperature and, you know, make sure he's taking his breathing treatments. And so I think my love and passion for helping people really stemmed from that. And, of course, my desire to work with um, older adults um, came from my passion and love of uh, my grandparents. And so, like a lot of people who go into psychology or mental health field, I did have the initial uh, plan to go to medical school. Um, And when I was in undergrad, I realized that although medicine is a wonderful profession, you don't really get to spend time knowing your patients and really getting to know their stories. And so that's when I started to explore other options and, you know, just really found my home in psychology, knowing that that was a way to really connect with patients and still help them in a very Mm -hmm. meaningful way. Interesting. Yeah, I think that that's fascinating that if you look back at at, uh, the childhoods of helping professionals, oftentimes you'll see that there were experiences where they were either, like in your case, uh, in a a helping capacity with a family member, um, or, you know, you always hear, you know, these professionals, they'll say, yeah, when I was in high school, um, all these kids used to come to me with their problems, and I was able to help them, and you know all that kind of stuff. But they're kind of different, uh, you know, those types of experiences that seem to lay the uh, foundation for uh, career choices later on in life. So I think that's always interesting to ask people about that. In your case, uh, it was helping your grandparents. Definitely. Yeah. Well, let's look at at, at this a little bit closely. So. Um, at the VA, you have uh, veterans, and um, I'm not as familiar with the VA system, and uh, may- maybe the uh, mental note-, note takers aren't either. So tell us a little bit about how the VA system works in terms of 
services that you provide, are they uh, inpatient? Are they outpatient? How, how does all that work? Mm-hmm. So the VA um, offers a host of um, mental health services, inpatient, outpatient, and actually some um, kind of long-term treatments. And um, when I first came to um, the VA, I did work in some of our long-term care settings. And so I described those as um, kind of like nursing home-like. Okay. Um, they call them community living centers mm-hmm. and was able to provide mental health services to the veterans that were living in those um, settings. Okay. And then um, now I do work in an outpatient setting. Um, and, you know, we get referrals from here. We are here in Nashville and uh, Murfreesboro, but we receive referrals from veterans who live as far away as Georgia and Kentucky. Wow. Um, so we have a very large catchment area. So what made you decide to, um, well, let, before I ask that, so the, the services that you provide um, ha, or have provided to the veterans, to the older veterans, um, are they outpatient? Do they come to see you on an outpatient basis or do you see them uh, in, in the hospital itself? How, who do you see? Um, currently, I just see um, patients in an outpatient setting, so they'll just come for their appointments. Um, now, other clinicians within um, the system do see patients inpatient um, still, um, either medical inpatient, um, psychiatric inpatient, or residential. Um, and we actually are able to provide services to some veterans in their homes. Okay. So either um, some providers go to veterans' homes or we um, can use technology and pretty much a, a VA system of Skype. To provide telemental health services, and yeah, I've I've read stuff about that. That's becoming a lot more popular, isn't it? Yes, um, and it's really interesting. Um, at first, it was the veteran would have to come to a, some kind of clinic, and then we could broadcast from one clinic to another right. to provide the services. But they are doing them in the home now. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that the VA really has led the movement in telemental health uh, therapy. You, you see a lot of. Uh, well, the, the private insurance companies are starting to pay for that now. And, you know, a lot of counselors, therapists are doing that on a private basis. But really, it was the VA that, that uh, set the standard for, for all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, I was going to ask you, uh, so you have these uh, patients primarily seeing you on an outpatient basis. What kind of uh, problems or issues are they uh, presenting with, Aaron? Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of see um, maybe a mix of, of kind of in thirds of what I um, typically see. So a third of the patients are often the ones who have had long-standing mental health problems, and so that continues into late life. Um, and then and that would be depression, anxiety, um, and, of course, a lot of um, our veterans also have PTSD. Okay. Um, and sometimes that's been long-standing or it may um, kind of resurface after retirement. Um, and then about a third that I see are really facing just adjustment issues um, okay. related to late life. And so um, we see a lot of um, older males that um, have a hard time adjusting to retirement. Ah. Um, and so get a lot of those kind of referrals, um, as well as health conditions, the loss of a spouse, um, taking on new roles or role shifts, you know, maybe their older uh, uh, adult children are now caring for them. And so kind of that shift in the parent-child relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, And then about a third of who I see are um, usually older adults themselves who are providing some kind of um, care for a loved one who has a cognitive disability or um, disorder. I see. um, Like a dementia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you, you know, you typically think of the VA as, you know, you think of the, the veterans, and I think the, the, the stereotype would be, oh, these are guys that have fought in wars and they have PTSD. But that's not always the case from how you're describing this. There could be a, really a broad range of problems that they're dealing with that aren't uh, war-related. Oh, correct. Um so although we do, see, you know, I see a lot of people who have served in combat and may have had or 
currently do have symptoms or diagnosis of PTSD, a lot of times the concerns that they are really bringing to the table and want to work in or work on in therapy are just kind of everyday problems, current stressors, things that are impacting their life now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Aaron, what, I mean, you could have worked in a lot of different settings, uh, but you chose the VA. How come? Um, well, I, I really do relate to the mission. Um, my other grandfather, not the one that I mentioned before, um, uh -huh. was retired military, and so um, I had that kind of um, upbringing. My mom would always talk about him, and we just knew about his service, and I think, you know, just connecting to that mission, a way to give back to um, the country without okay. necessarily serving myself. Sure. Um, and then, you know, the VA is just so strong in its tradition of training psychologists. I think that's an important yes. um, role we play. And then I think that we're, I know that we're allowed to be really innovative in the services we provide. So I mentioned earlier that we have an interprofessional clinic that I um, work out of. And we've really just been able to create that from kind of our minds of saying what would be a great way to care for our older uh, veterans. And we decided it would really be a team approach. And we were able to put the team together and decide kind of what that clinic would look like. And we're able to see patients with two different providers in the same room at the same time, right. three if we need. So I think just that flexibility to be creative and provide the care that's needed, not necessarily what's going to be most easily billed for. Yeah, I think if I remember back uh, when I was applying for my psychology internships, it was back in uh, 1990, I think it was, uh, I applied to a lot of the VA centers. Uh, they, they actually, when you look back then uh, at how much these places paid the interns, uh, I think the VA actually paid much better than uh, a lot of the other places did. Uh, I didn't. I didn't end up doing an internship there, but uh, boy, they had a lot of good um, experiences that they offered interns, training experiences, and I'm sure that that your facility is uh, a lot like that too, in providing really good training experiences for the uh, for the uh, interns. I definitely like to think so as a director of training, <laughs> but, uh, but but we definitely do have just so many different areas you can work in and yeah. different ways um, that you can provide services just different than maybe, um, you know, a, a counseling center where you know, it's kind of one modality and right. you know, one patient population. It's really very diverse here. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the, um, the elderly patients who are seen at the, um, at the VA center. I wonder if some of the issues that they present are different than issues than than you would see in a typical you know outpatient practice at a community mental health center or private practice um, because they're veterans and because of their age. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned earlier, you know I do see a lot of people because of these transitions and changes in late life, and so I think one of the big differences. Um, both because of their age, but also because of their veteran status and the fact that um, they may have served in combat. We see people that just have a lot of health comorbidities. So I think that's oh. an overlay that you may not see in other practice settings. So mm -hmm. being really mindful of how pain may interfere with their mental health or diabetes, um, heart conditions, COPD, um, all those um, medical conditions that can sometimes look like uh, mental health symptoms right. and yeah sometimes can be exacerbated by or exacerbate the mental health symptoms themselves. So I think that's really different. Um, and, you know, I think that the patients that we see who maybe have had a long standing mental health um, diagnosis, they may not look a whole lot different than what you would see in another setting. Um, okay. But I'm always struck by the person who comes in for their first mental health evaluation, maybe when they're 70, and it was the first time they really thought, hey, I need help oh, wow. dealing or coping with a life stressor. You know, they felt like they were always able to handle what life had handed them, and maybe, you know, their wife died, and now they're not sure what to do with themselves. And so I think that is something maybe different than what um, people who don't work with older adults would see. 
Is there something, uh, do you have to work differently with a person who's older um, as opposed to how you might work with a young adult or something like that? What what might be some of the differences along uh, those lines, Erin? Mm-hmm. I think, um, and this is definitely changing, and I've been in practice about 11 years now, and I've even seen it changing um, But sometimes just kind of breaking down the stereotype of what mental health treatment is. Um, A lot of older adults weren't raised in a culture where it was acceptable to talk about mental health issues Ah, or to ah. um, (laughs) go seek mental health services. So I think sometimes breaking down that um, barrier, um, normalizing their experience, um, giving them a lot of psychoeducation about um, what psychology is, what psychology isn't. Um, I still get a lot of questions of where's your couch? <laughs> they kind of want to lay down and talk. Um, and so I think that's um, something that you have to um, adjust to. And of course, you know, if there's any cognitive problems, um, you would have to adjust your therapy. Um, I found that someone with like a mild cognitive impairment or um, kind of an early um, stages of a dementia can still benefit um, from psychotherapy services. It just may be that you have to go a little bit slower, right. um, provide information in multiple modalities, um, maybe get a loved one in there to kind of help support the process. Um, and, you know, we get a lot of people who have hearing impairment, and so sometimes just um, making sure that you're being un- understood in the ah, session, reminding sure. them to wear their hearing aids, things like that. Um, and then I think that just being aware of all the other kind of aspects of aging, you know, when you work with older adults, you have to understand how does Social Security work? How does Medicare work? Um, right. How does, you know, getting into a nursing home, how does that process work? And um, understanding how to link them with resources. So I think that's kind of something else that's um, probably different than working with younger adults. You have to know a lot about resources, and uh, a lot of a lot of the things you were just mentioning there are things that you would um, think about with our, our social work colleagues. Um, you know those types of things, but it's even important for psychologists and, and counselors to know about those things as well. I, I think anyway, that's my personal belief. You know, when you look at the at how you know you help these people. There's certainly a lot of different ways uh, of helping them from, you know, the point where they come in to see you where they have this problem till, the, you know, point B where, you, you know, they don't have the problem anymore or they, they do, but it's not as bad as it was. And uh, I think you had mentioned to me before that uh, uh, interpersonal psychotherapy for depression might be an approach that you might use with these people. Can you talk about that approach at all, Aaron? And uh, some of our listeners might not be familiar with that, but uh, this is an approach I think that you've used, and uh, maybe you could share a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and just to kind of put a caveat there, I often use IPT and um, CBT approaches kind of hand in hand. Okay. Um, but with the IPT piece, um, it really looks at kind of four areas in a person's life that they might be um, having difficulties in. And so the first one would be role changes or transitions. So um, we often see that if someone's gone from a full-time employee to, you know, someone who's staying at home right. or maybe right. someone's gone from a husband to a widow. So, you know, those kinds of transitions. Um, Role disputes, um, that's just, you know, kind of, it speaks for itself. Um, We Mm -hmm. can see that with adult children, you know, who's going to start making the decisions Ah. um, about my care, you know, is that still going to be me or have I given up my autonomy to, you know, my child? So sometimes we see that. Um, Definitely bereavement and grief, um, once again, that speaks for itself. And then the last area, um, I don't see this as much, but it does come up, and this is interpersonal deficits. And so when I see that, it's often a person who, um, you know, maybe all their friends were from their work. And so once they are retired, they're not really sure how to make new friendships or connections. And so it's maybe not a deficit um, so much, but something they haven't practiced in a long time. And so sometimes they kind of need some nudging of, Where do you start looking for friends? How do you introduce yourself? You know, those kinds of things. Um, And, you know, as I mentioned before, I think a huge part of bringing someone into therapy and helping them recover from whatever um, 
their concern or issue is is the psychoeducation piece. I think that especially if they've never sought mental health care before, they often think they're the only one that might be experiencing right. this problem. And so normalizing, letting them know that a lot of people have these problems and um, even though they've been able to cope and manage with other life crises in the past, you know, this is kind of a normal phase for them to sure. be going through. Um, and I think it's really important to highlight their past strengths. Um, they probably have some really great coping skills in their tool bag, and mm -hmm. for some reason they just aren't accessing them at this point. And so reminding them of what those are or helping them to modify them. You know, maybe someone um, used to use exercise um, as a great coping okay. mechanism, and now they have physical limitations. And so um, often we'll see kind of that all or none thinking of, oh, well, I can't exercise anymore, so I can't do anything physical that's going to help me. Um, but maybe helping them brainstorm well, what are some things you can still do or what did you used to enjoy and how can we modify that for um, whatever physical condition you're facing now? So a lot of time it's just that support, um, knowing they're not alone um, and just helping them to kind of look at the world and the things they're facing in the, from a different viewpoint or in a different way than they were on their own. Right. So that the, the interpersonal uh, psychotherapy approach is um, you, you have basically those four areas that you would cover. It sounds like there could be some overlap between uh, some of those areas, like you were just talking about the interpersonal deficit uh, where and a person is in that role transition of, you know, they don't have exactly. all their buddies, and so there might be some overlap between those areas too. And the thing I wonder about also as you were talking about these things is what role does the family play in helping um, some of these patients move from point A to point B where they're able to function better? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, as in most cases, you know, if the family system's intact and somewhat healthy, I think that they can be really helpful um, in supporting these transitions. Um, right. Sometimes it's actual instrumental support. You know, maybe this older adult actually needs someone to drive them to the senior center or, you know, um, help them um, practice these skills. And sometimes it's just someone that's going to be a champion for them to let them know, I'm here for you. I'm going to help you as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of the patients I've seen over the years have very limited social or family support. Oh. Um, and so that definitely makes it difficult um, when we're trying to address some of these um, role or interpersonal problems. What's the reason that they don't have that level of support, Erin, fr from the family? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our veteran population, I think that you know, if they did struggle, let's say, with PTSD in the past, I think that can be very disruptive, yeah. to, like marital and family relationships. So I think sometimes those have just eroded over time. Um, and, you know, I find that a lot of our veterans tend to just have a little bit more of kind of a solitary um, personality or lifestyle than uh -huh. what you might see um, from others. Um, and also, I've just seen a lot that have moved away from family um, okay. for whatever reason, you know, that they're, or their adult children have moved away from them. And so a right. lot of times they just don't have that level of support they once did. So in your work with um, these patients, what are, what are some of the, um, the primary challenges in, in working with them? I, you know, sometimes it's just hard to get patients to kind of buy into what you're offering or what you think would be helpful, but what are some of the primary challenges in, in helping this population, Erin? Mm -hmm. I think that they're just so complex. Um, you know, I've talked about kind of the medical overlay that yeah. we deal with, um, but, you know, with older adults, you know, there's also a lot of um, other um, factors at play. Um, a lot of times our older adults are living on very fixed incomes. Um, many do live in poverty. Um, and so I think that's something we have to be mindful of and right. figure out, you know, how are we going to work around that or with that as part of our therapy. Um, I think that those are the challenges. And of course, if we're dealing with someone who's facing some cognitive decline, that's a challenge that we have to address. Um, and then I've already mentioned kind of the limited social support, but, you know, it's coming into my mind about a lot of our dementia caregivers and about how they really feel like they're out there on their own providing the support. And oh, yeah. it's really hard oh, yeah. 
when they don't feel like they have anyone they can reach out to. Mm -hmm. So, so I think from what how you're kind of talking about this, the, the challenges are it's just not the, the the actual mental health issue that patients are presenting with. It's you have to kind of look at them within their context, right? Like the context being their their families. Uh, they're looking at their health conditions. You had mentioned uh, poverty. I mean, all of these things uh, make for a, a complex uh, type of situation here. And I guess that's that's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, well, you definitely can't view them in kind of in a mental health vacuum because I think if you leave out those other pieces, you know, any work you do or um, treatment plan that you agree upon is probably going to just not work out because right. those other factors are going to interfere. Exactly. Well, Aaron, this last part of the interview is what I uh, refer to as uh, make a mental note. And it's something that you feel uh, is important for the audience to make a mental note of in terms of, oh, maybe improving their mental health or their relationships. Um, and, and maybe we, we have um, some folks in the audience who, who are older uh, what's one tip or suggestion, maybe some words of wisdom that you might have to help an audience member, whether it's a potential patient, whether it's a family member of a patient, just to improve their mental wellness or relationships, even if just a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, this reminds me, I did a recent talk on healthy aging, and, you know, I think that maybe not one tip, but maybe just a handful, okay. you know, just take good care of yourself. I think that if we can take good care of ourselves from a young age, it's great, but even if you start doing it when you are later in life, you know, eat well, exercise, um, nurture your relationships, because we find that those are the things that are really going to promote a healthy aging trajectory. So, um, if we can do it early, our trajectory is even better, but we know even later in life, if we start to make those changes and um, in our lifestyle, we can see improvements and even in our mental health. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Well, Aaron, uh, how, how can someone get a hold of you if they're interested in uh, maybe learning a little bit more about the VA or getting set up? Uh, with the VA uh, for services, or, or, or maybe uh, there's a number that they can call. Uh, you're located in, uh, I think, Nashville and, and Murfreesboro. So how can uh, potential uh, veterans get involved with the VA? Uh -huh. So um, I think the easiest way, if someone um, needed um, services for um, any kind of care at the VA, they could call our main number, 615-867-6000. Um, okay. um, but if you have any viewer or listeners who um, are interested in just learning maybe more about what I do specifically or um, about kind of training in GERO psychology, um, they can email me directly. Um, it's drdraaronpatel at gmail.com. Wonderful. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today, Aaron, and, and being our last official guest of the Make a Mental Note podcast. This is really interesting to kind of learn, actually learn more about not only uh, the, um, the geropsychology, this area and this, this population, but also about the VA. I think that was uh, a real nice, uh, real nice information that you presented. So I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I really uh, appreciate Aaron coming on, uh, being our last uh, guest on the Make a Mental Note podcast series. Here's my mental notes takeaway from uh, my discussion with, uh, uh, with Aaron. As a mental health professional, um, when working with older adults, including veterans, it's important to not simply ask them about their uh, mental health symptoms and to treat those but to try to operate from a broader perspective. So in other words, understanding the client within the context of their, of their health, uh, relationships, culture, their financial situation, and, and their religious orientation, if, if any, that that provides for a richer framework from which to help these clients. Now here's my question for you. Are all issues that uh, older veterans deal with, are they all, all combat related? Well, the answer is no, and you probably knew that. Some veterans uh, didn't, don't participate in war. 
And so they may be dealing with the typical types of issues that, that many people deal with, including uh, changes in their health or their cognitive functioning, uh, financial strain, and, and adjusting to changes like uh, retirement or the loss of a loved one. Okay, check out my website, chriscorto.com, C-H-R-I-S-Q-U-A-R-T-O.com for the show notes of, of today's podcast episode. And as I noted at the beginning of this podcast, this is the last Make a Mental Note, Note podcast episode, and, and it's going to be replaced by my new one called Private Practice Journeys. So this podcast is, is, is designed for therapists who want to start or expand a private practice. So, you know, if, if you're someone who listens to mental health podcast episodes a lot of times, what hosts will do is they'll, they'll interview a different therapist every week, kind of like what I've been doing on Make a Mental Note. But for the Private Practice Journeys podcast series, I'm only interviewing four therapists who are starting or expanding their practices, and I'm interviewing each of them once a month throughout 2017. So so, uh, you and other listeners can learn about the nuts and bolts of building a practice. And you'll be able to access the podcast episodes on my website, (laughs) chriscorto.com, once my website guy makes the final updates to my website. But for now, if you'd like to listen to the first episode, it's it's just me uh, introducing the podcast series. Just type the words Private Practice Journeys Podcast into Google, and you should be able to access it on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. Now, there's also a Facebook community that I encourage you to join called Private Practice Journeys Community. Well, listen, I've had a great time doing this podcast, and I hope you've learned a lot by listening to it. The episodes have been downloaded about 14,000 times, so I know that I've achieved my goal in educating people about various mental health issues. Now, if you're a therapist, my plan is to create some short, some short quizzes for each episode that you can take and earn continuing education credits if you'd like to do that. And um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll post a notification about that on the Private Practice Journeys Facebook community once I develop the quizzes. So that's another reason to join the group. Okay, well, thanks again for listening and have a great rest of the week. 